uh, Log Brunmankowski conjecture. So, so thanks very much. Originally, she was going to be visiting here for a couple of days. She ended up, um, you know, obviously that got canceled so, for obvious reasons. But anyway, so we're pleased to have her. And uh, so thanks. Thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, for letting me speak, and thanks everyone for coming to the talk. Uh, I wanted to say, please interrupt me with questions anytime. Uh, it's actually online. I find it most important that people react and ask questions and, and say things back. I would love it. I would please don't hesitate. Um, so yes, I will talk about the logbook Minkowski conjecture. Just a few remarks on that, which, in my opinion, is a fascinating subject. I will start with some notation. If anything is, if I'm going too quick, please slow me down. The talk is a bit long, but I will probably not get to the end of it. I'll just try and make it not too long. Uh, so I work in convex geometry, which is a subject that in, involves dealing with convex bodies a lot. The body is convex if it's compact and uh, has an empty interior, and any two points can be connected uh, by an interval fully contained inside the set. Uh, Lebesgue measure I denote as here. This is my standard notation for Lebesgue measure. Um, Minkowski sum of sets is just a pointwise collection of points, which are sums of elements from the first set and the second set. Uh, a support function of a convex set, here's the definition of that function. It's a function defined on the entire RN. It's a dual norm of, uh, of the convex body K, written here. Geometrically, if a vector Y is a unit, then uh, the support function is nothing but the distance from the origin to the hyperplane uh, at the point y, uh, as a, a, orthogonal to y. So, so this would be, so if nx is y here, okay, then the support function at the point nx is a distance from the origin to the hyperplane orthogonal to this vector to the convex set K. Uh, and the nice property about of, of the support function, yes? Excuse me, uh, does K oh. always contain the origin? Yes. Does K always contain the origin? Uh, yes, yeah. actually. Okay. So for the, uh, I didn't say it, I'm sorry. Yes, for the stock, we should always assume that K contains the origin. Moreover, okay. most of the time I will assume for the stock that the set K is origin symmetric. Uh, I didn't have the definition here, but uh, let, let's say we assume that K is symmetric, meaning that if X is in K, then uh, minus X is also in K. This a lot of the time will be the assumption. Um, not always, but support functions of convex sets are additive. This is a very nice property. If I add K and L, the support functions just add. Uh, I use notation N with subindex X for the unit normal to the boundary of k at the point x. So if this is my x, this is my unit normal, I call it an x. And support function is just the scalar product of the unit normal and x. So this guy is a support function. Uh, second fundamental form I denote by just standard notation like that. And uh, its trace is the mean curvature. So these are just the notations. Uh, any questions? So uh, let me recall. Excuse me, I have, uh, excuse me, I have one question. Yes. So given K, obviously we know HK. If we know H, how much do we know K? Is K uh, determined it's by? Determined. Support oh, function. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. The support function uniquely determines the convex body. It's one homogeneous. Yes, it's one to one correspondent. OK, great. Like convex. Okay, so uh, uh, let me now mention uh, a very important inequality in convexity, which kind of motivates uh, this entire subject, the Brimminkowski inequality. Uh, it basically tells us that the Lebesgue measure is log concave. That if I take a convex combination of two sets K and L, not necessarily convex, by the way, just any real measurable sets, let's say, uh, this volume is bounded from below by the geometric average of volumes of K and L. And I remind, I denote this, this um, I denote volume as absolute value. Um, and uh, 
A stronger inequality holds, moreover, that tells us the volume is not just log concave, but one over n concave. I can estimate the average of convex set scanl of any sorry set scanl well measurable from below by the nth power of this quantity. So the first statement is always stronger, the first statement is always weaker than the second statement because just by hold is inequality because the geometric average is always smaller than arithmetic than some power p average. But for the bag measure, interestingly enough, those two things are completely equivalent because uh, actually, um, here, equivalent. because um, the bag measure is n homogeneous. And so it turns out that if it's n homogeneous, it's just the same statement, it's easy to show, and we will actually see it today. Um, let me say that Brunikovsky inequality is something that should be thought of as an inequality of isoperimetric type. Uh, and moreover, the classical isoperimetric inequality follows from it. So let me remind you that the classical isoperimetric inequality tells us that uh, for all measurable sets, for all measurable sets of volume equal to the volume of the unit wall, for example, the perimeter, which I denote like this, is bigger than the perimeter of the ball. So the ball is the set of the smallest perimeter fixed volume. And it follows from Brunikovsky inequality just in one line. Here is this line. Here in this inequality, we applied this statement. And um, it turns out that what's written here, if we divide by this normalizing factor of the volume, it's exactly, it's going to be the uh, area of the sphere. A any questions about this slide? Uh, the n is the, uh, n is the dimension or it's arbitrary? Integer. Yes, yes, and the, so I will always be working in uh, n-dimensional space, oh, Rn. Okay. It's Euclidean okay. n-dimensional space, Rn. Yes, thank you, yes. Uh, very good, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Okay, yes, so I in this talk I will discuss a lot uh, local, yes? Um, yes? For the estimate, well, for the boundary of K, you say for all Borel measurable, sets k, do you not need some smoothness on the boundary for this? Uh, well, uh, you can know, actually this, this quantity, I believe, can be defined for arbitrary sets. Um, I, I, okay. You could be uh -huh. real measurable. I think, I mean, this quantity, this is my definition of perimeter. There are other definitions that require more smoothness, but this is sort of the most uh, robust. I think I might be wrong, but okay. you don't need okay. you to have any counter set anything. Yeah. Good question. Any more questions? Okay, so yeah, this, in my opinion, it's the simplest proof of there is a parametric inequality, by the way, because uh, the proof of this Brunin-Kosky inequality is actually just a few lines. It was done in full generality in 1935 by Rosternik. I don't have time to discuss the Original simple proof I will discuss instead of complicated proof. <laughs> Any more questions? So, yes, yeah, so in this talk I will discuss the local version of uh, such all such inequalities of the Minkowski type. What does it mean, a local version? So, here is an idea. By the way, Steven also works on similar subjects, and I find uh, it's a very nice thing to take an inequality and consider a local version also. So what we do is the following. We look at the set K and we look at the set L. And uh, suppose we want to try and move continuously from the set K into the set L. And the movement is we're taking a direction, normal, norm, normal vector to K, and we see how far we need to move our support hyperplane to K, and we move with this speed. So basically at the, at, at the place where K is closer to L in terms of the difference between support uh, planes, we move slowly, and where it's far away from L, we move faster, so that we arrive in trail at the same time. Uh, there are smart words for it in terms of geometric flows, but I'm not going to say any of those smart words. So we consider a function of psi on the sphere, which is the difference of support functions HL and HK, and at the time moment t, kt is the average of uh, k and L, and it will have the support function ht, which is hk plus t times this function psi. And what we will be interested in is the situation when t is zero. 
And uh, it turns out that from the Brennan-Minkowski inequality, the slow concavity formulation, it follows that the logarithm of the set kt defined here is concave. And that it's a concave function of one variable, therefore its second derivative is negative or non-positive. And the second derivative of a logarithm of a positive function is, is, is negative if and only if this inequality holds it's just calculus. So because Berminkowski inequality holds, it turns out that the function f defined as the volume of the set kt obtained by this perturbation is it satisfies this inequality at the moment zero. And moreover, it turns out it's enough to prove that this inequality at the moment zero is true for all k and for all functions psi and then you can recover the Brennan-Minkowski inequality. So let me repeat this inequality here for this function f, where ht is again a separate function of that time of, of, of a set k at time t. So let's pass from the sphere function psi was a different from the support function, right? So let's pass from the sphere to the boundary of k and consider psi evaluated as the normal vector. Then uh, what will those derivatives look like? Well, f of zero is just the volume of k, volume of k zero, k zero is just k. Now, uh, f prime of zero, it's uh, actually, you, you can see what happens is that we're pushing along the boundary of k with the speed f. So the derivative of the volume of what happened or, or, of this changed body will be just the integral of f, something that geometrically should be included. And finally, the second derivative, it's a little harder to compute. Uh, there are different ways to do it, uh, using chengen yao calculus, for example, or, or using actually the ideas from geometric flows and integration by parts of the boundary. So th it has expression as written here in terms of the mean curvature and second fundamental form. And uh, this is the boundary gradient, the Levitch Vita connection of the manifold, which is the boundary of K. So, in other words, to summarize, Grimminkowski inequality implies and follows from this expression, this inequality here. Because I, I just rewrite this plug in the formulas that were obtained. Uh, it was uh, derived by Kolesanti in 2008, and Kolesnikov and Minman redirived it in their 2015 paper. Um, any questions so far? So, this is what I'm going to call the local or infinitesimal form of the Brunin-Kosky inequality. I guess there's there's a little detail here. So the I guess all these quantities have to be defined, like mean curvature, second fundamental form, uh, you know, on an arbitrary convex body. They won't. Yeah. Be Th thank you very much. So let's assume for this talk that the set K is infinitely smooth, function F is infinitely smooth, absolutely everyone is infinitely smooth. It's uh, okay. yes, you're right. Uh, usually, well, smoothness of the of the second uh, derivative is okay. Usually there is no problem. Uh, because, by the way, note that the Brunin-Minkowski inequality itself, uh, as stated in the previous slide, it admits approximation. So, actually, if we want to prove Brunin-Minkowski inequality, we can, we, we can assume any kind of smoothness we want. Okay, anyway, so we assume that everything is smooth, this inequality holds. Now, let me discuss some completely abstract observation. Suppose we have any uh, algebra which is a vector space and any symmetric bilinear form which is negative for any element a. So q of a is always non-positive. I'm doing it because of this inequality. You can view this inequality as a symmetric bilinear form evaluated at f. Either way, so suppose we have such a thing, then we can always strengthen this inequality with respect to any fixed element. Namely, let's take any element z in the algebra. Then, because this inequality holds for all elements in the algebra, uh, we can say that q of a plus tz, a plus tz also is non-positive. And if we use bilinearity and open it up, we get this quadratic inequality. This quadratic inequality is optimized at some specific point, and we plug this optimal point 
and get so-called Schwarz inequality, which is, well, we proved the famous Cauchy Schwarz inequality here. But what's interesting about this is that um, this new inequality is stronger than our initial assumption on the bilinear form. And it is invariant now under agent A plus TZ. So now if we were try to if we try to optimize this inequality with respect to some element, we're not gonna get anything better. It's the optimal thing. Long story short, any such bilinear inequality can be strengthened as much uh, as possible with respect to any given element. So that the resultant inequality is invariant under agent. So let's apply this observation for the local version of the Bernoulli-Kowski inequality. And the favorite element that we take here that turns out to work really well, non-surprisingly, is the support function. So the idea is we're going from K into L and we want to do it in some optimal way. So basically, let's factor out on the, all the blow-ups of K. If our function that with which we blow up K is the support function of K itself, it's just the dilation. And Lebesgue measure is inhomogeneous, so it turns out that it, it gives something nice. And namely, if you integrate the parts and check, that you see that what we get is the improved version of the local, oops, here. The improved version of the local Brunnenkowski inequality, where we have the factor of n minus one over n here, which is better than, better than one. Stronger inequality, and it is now invariant under agent the support function to f. Note, by the way, that, uh, so, and, and of course, one thing I didn't write here, but this new version is the local version of one over n from k, which is the Brunning-Kowski inequality that I mentioned earlier, let me even go back to this. So the second expression is the local version of this inequality, whereas the first expression is the local version of this inequality. Go back to the place where I was. Um, here. Yes. Um, interesting thing here is that if k is the unit ball, then uh, we plug everything in. Of course, for the unit ball, second fundamental form and curvature, very nice things. And what we get here is just the Poincare inequality on the sphere. There's a constant 1 over n minus 1, which is sharp. It's the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian of the sphere, it's n minus 1. So Brun-Minkowski in particular, what we arrived to here, it, it yields the sharp on Karen inequality on the sphere, which is very nice. Again, it's a pretty simple proof of the Karen inequality. Um, any questions so far? So like I said, it's invariant now under change in the time and it's invariant under the delay in the function. And because of that, one can even simplify this inequality and write it in terms of so-called mixed volumes, which is a popular and simple object in convexity. So a mixed volume of two sets K and M is defined as some factor of the K derivative of K plus Tm. So in other words, we, we, we take our K and we add our M to it. So this is M. We just take M and we sort of move it around K and we differentiate and this is exactly the same procedure as we did before with an arbitrary function, but now we are doing it as a support function of M. Uh, therefore, if F is a support function of the convex body M, then, when, then Brun-Minkowski, the local version of the Brun-Minkowski inequality becomes the so-called Minkowski second inequality. So the second mixed volume is smaller than, the second mixed volume is the second derivative, first mixed volume is the first derivative. And uh, moreover, it's equivalent to the Brunnikowski inequality itself because uh, this statement, the first statement is invariant under adding arbitrary amount of support function of K to F and therefore we can always add so much of the support function that it becomes a support function of some other convex. So the Minkowski second inequality is equivalent to the local to, to the local version of the Green Minkowski inequality, consequently to the Green Minkowski inequality itself. Uh, any questions so far? So now one might wonder 
how to prove if one can prove the Brunig. It's, it's also so far introduction. I'm not. I haven't got to the results yet, but I will. Um, so one might wonder if one can prove Brunigovsky inequality using this this local version directly. Uh, in dimension two, there is a proof using Fourier analysis, which I like. It uses just Fourier coefficients and basically boils everything down to some nice expression. In arbitrary dimension, there is this wonderful uh, argument uh, by Kolesnikov and Milman in 2015 or so, uh, which is the proof of Minkowski inequality using so called L2 method. So the goal is to show this, remember, the uh, local version of the Minkowski inequality, which is this. We want to show that for any k and for any f on the boundary of k, this holds. So for any function u on the set k itself with a normal derivative equal to our function f on the boundary, we can rewrite this guy as in terms of space integration. In fact, this goal will follow from the inequality written here. The idea is that, first of all, this integral of f just corresponds to the integral of the Laplacian squared. And um, the second derivative can be estimated from above in terms of this is so called gamma 2 operator. In this case, it can be done in a much more general way. But, uh, this is basically just integration by parts and using some inequality in a clever way, but it can be estimated in the space integrals of u. And so, therefore, what we want to prove follows from showing that the average of the Hessian, of the Hilbert phenomenon is a Hessian square that's bigger than the variance of the Laplacian. The variance comes from squaring uh, the Laplacian here and squaring, taking squares of Laplacian there. Uh, that is bigger than, yes, the variance of the integral of the Laplacian plus one over n times the expected value of the Laplacian squared. And this one over n comes from this n minus one over n factor here. And it turns out that actually this is always true. Uh, if we let u be such that it's Laplacian square. Indeed, it's an natural thing to do. We want to kill this variance. We want to minimize the variance. How do we minimize the variance of a random variable? We, we make it, we can make it zero if the random variable is constant. Uh, so basic question is if you have an arbitrary function f, can we find such a function u such as its Laplacian is constant and its normal derivative corresponds to f? And well, the answer is yes, it's a very classical result in TDE that uh, this um, linear second order differential equation can be solved with arbitrary Neumann boundary condition. And uh, what remains to show is that the expected value of the Hessian squared is bigger than the on a random expected value of Laplacian squared, and it's actually always true for and twice because Hilbert norm squared of any matrix is bigger than the trace squared over n. So this is the entire proof. Uh, it's much more complicated than uh, the simple proof of the study from 1935, but this, this gives a bit more insight into how this inequality works. Are there any questions so far? I might have a question. The <laughs> the function little yes. f started life in terms of the support functions for k and another set l are there abstract yes. characterizations of such functions f or are all functions f possible all smooth all smooth functions can be written as a difference of two convex functions homogeneous so it's actually arbitrary function f it's true for arbitrary f so if I start just with k, I can take f to be arbitrary. Yes, and then we will get some other convex body. We would need k to be strictly convex, or else we cannot uh, take the derivative. So if we want, if we have k and we start we start moving it with some arbitrary f, we might have a problem if if we have a flat bit in k. But if we assume that it's strictly convex, there is always at least small interval zero epsilon where this procedure is legit, and we are only taking the derivative at zero. So, mm, okay. Like we Thank don't you. care what if this procedure is, you know, good for a long time. We only need to say okay, we're at zero. Mm, okay. Thank you. So, like I said, I'm, I'm swiping at the direction details. But thanks for asking. Any more questions?
So let me now switch to discussing the so-called log Brominkowski conjecture. Uh, so the logarithmic sum of convex bodies is defined similarly to the Minkowski sum, but instead of taking uh, sum of support functions, we take geometric average of support functions, and we take the collection of all such vectors x in a rent that for any unit vector u, for any u, um, it's this, the support function at, at, at evaluated at u is bounded by the geometric average. So this is ideologically, um, imagine if k is, let's say, a polytop and L is another polytop with parallel sizes. Okay, good. Uh, what we do is we draw another polytop and the distances to the sides are geometric averages of the distances. This is the zero sum logarithmic sum. Because of arithmetic geometric mean inequality, uh, zero sum is always smaller than the usual Minkowski sum. It's a smaller sum. But Borowski, Lutro, Kang, and John conjectured in 2011 that for origin symmetric convex set K and L, the zero sum, although it's a smaller set, can still be estimated from below by the geometric average of volumes, just like the uh, arithmetic sum can by Brunnikovsky inequality. So this origin symmetry and convexity assumptions are definitely necessary. If you, for example, take K and L and shift, if K is, and L are the same ball, let's say, and we shift the ball a bit, so, so sorry, so K is a ball and L is a shifted ball, slightly shifted from the origin. Uh, it's not gonna work, it's gonna immediately fail. So unlike uh, Minkowski sum, it's not invariant on the shift, so some very strong structural assumptions are required for this to be true, but the conjecture is that this is true for symmetric convex set. And um, it's interesting that it's equivalent to uniqueness of solutions of the Monja pair equations with its equality cases. And those questions go back actually to fire to the 80s rather than 2011. It turns out that it's been studied a lot in the theory of geometric flows. Um, the conjecture is true in dimension two, as was shown by Burroughs, Kudrick, Young, Jan, and Selvat. Stanku did some related work for polytops even before that. Uh, it's true for unconditional sets. Uh, as was shown by Sarah Glue and Kadero for Denise and Murray, uh, even earlier, and Borowski and Kalantopoulos recently also proved that it's true under some symmetry assumptions that the more general is unconditional, but still there is certain symmetry assumptions that are required. Uh, it's true for complex convex bodies, which was shown by the Rotom, and pretty much uh, in terms of global formulations, nothing else is known about this inequality in some good way. So let me now switch to discussing the local version of this inequality. Are there any questions about the, the conjecture? I just had a comment. The proof on the previous page did look to me like kind of like an optimal transport proof. So now that you mentioned Monge and Perry equation, seems, yeah, sensible. About uh, the, this, this proof? Uh, may, maybe there, is, there are, of course, also optimal transport proofs of the Minkowski inequality. This is kind of a little different idea that it's L2 okay, because enough. it's called L2 because you, it's based on the solvability of the Neumann system. It's based on the fact that for any functional boundary, you can find optimal. Well, it's, it's actually not necessarily optimal, but you find a good enough function in, 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 in the set. And uh, the fact that such solution exists is. Uh, the so-called Hilbert space theory or Sobola space theory, which is on two, which is, I'm not sure if it's the same as optimal transport, but maybe it's the same, it's hard for me to tell. Oh no, um, you're probably right. Any I'm more sure questions? Right. So about the, I, I really don't know. I, I mean, any questions about log Brominkowski conjectures also? This is what we will be discussing from now on. It's not about Brominkowski inequality, about this log Brominkowski conjecture. Um, okay. So what may I want to focus on is the local, may, may ask local one, version. Yes. One question. Yes. So uh, for yes. this, uh, yes. I mean, it's because in quality, it's related to the entropy, right? Kind of like different entropy, you end up with different in quality. Excellent. So, so is this absolutely uh, I mean, correct? Yes, you're 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 very much correct. 
yeah, right? There is this so, version of entropy which is uh, sort of log Minkowski uh -huh. content and it's equivalent to the validity of so-called log Minkowski inequality which is kind of something about entropy. Not, none of it is known, but yes, so you can write it in terms of something involving entropy, you're right. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, for I, the I classical... I'm talking about it. Yeah, yeah. For the classical proof, like you can use uh, basically uh, entropy on the suitable convexity, I mean, on the on suitable metric space, you compute the hashing. Accordingly, you can get some like a brain Mikoski proof. I don't know whether if you change it to a new one, if you still have a entropy, you can try the, I don't know, maybe it's some convexity, you know, can calculate yes, the okay. hashing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's good, yeah. One of the very popular approaches to this conjecture is exactly what you're saying, is exactly the log Minkowski inequality, which is something involved in entropy. And uh -huh. uh, still nobody knows if it's true. It's very hard. It does not to be very hard. It does not that if, you should, if in order to show that this entropy is uh, minimized where you want it to be minimized, which is k equals L case, you need uh -huh. uniqueness of um, the solution of certain modular pair equation, and you don't have it, and it's very hard. So, oh, I see, I see, I see. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 talk afterwards, yes, initiative, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, thanks for, thanks for your question, though. So let me, I want, I, my favorite approach has to do with this local version, this is the intensimal version, but I'm going to talk about that now. So this is our inequality, let's just memorize it. So let's try and do the same thing that we did with Brunlin-Kowski, but now with log brunlin -Kowski. Let's uh, try and get from K into L. I guess I don't have a picture here this time, but I can draw some together with K and this and L. And I want to get from K into L so that in the process in between, we get those logarithmic averages. So now instead of uh, subtracting support function of K from support function of L, I divide support function of K, L by support function of K. And then it turns out that locally for a small T, this average, it's called the Alexander body, by the way, something like that. Wolf shape, there's also a word for this, maybe you know. So then uh, the support function of KT, this HT can be written as H support function of K of our certain body times the function of Psi to the power T. And this thing we can also linearize in, in, by Taylor formula, so the write it as H, HK plus T times the correct function Psi here plus something that depends on T squared. So therefore, what happens when we take derivatives of this new process is the following. Again, we take a function f on the boundary, which is fun our function phi evaluated at the normal, which is this variable guy, and the uh, log Brunin-Kowski inequality yields again exactly the same thing. Again, we have log concavity of this addition, and uh, the value of the function f now is at zero exactly the same, as the volume of k. The first derivative is again exactly the same thing, it's an integral of f. Why? Because uh, the first derivative doesn't care at zero if you have this t squared term, and without the t squared term the situation is exactly the same as before. And now when we take the second derivative, when we take the second derivative, something happens, and in addition to what we had before, we have just additional term. That comes from the fact that addition is not Minkowski but logarithmic. And here's how it's written it's just integral of the boundary of our function f squared divided by the support function of k. This is what comes out, and therefore, so this is, we derived it with uh, Andrea Colisanti norm articulated a few years ago that if log by Minkowski inequality was true, then for any symmetric convex k and any function on the boundary, we would have this improved Poincare type inequality with this additional term. Without this term again, this is just a Brunikovsky, but for convex and symmetric sets, it's conjectured that the stronger inequality holds. And note that if, again, we let our convex body K to be a ball, then what happens is that this guy rewrites Again, as a Poincaré inequality, but now not with a function, one, not with a constant one over n minus one as it was before, you remember, but now with a constant one over n. Now, the Poincaré inequality on the sphere, of course, is not true with a constant one over n because one over n minus one is sharp. But for even functions f, if we assume the symmetry, it is true, and moreover, it's true with a constant one over two n. 
because the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian is 2n. So definitely if it's true with 1 over 2n, of course it's true with 1 over n. So in fact, ni as a pole, log Brunikovsky inequality actually doesn't even predict the strong con concavity in the symmetric case that happens there. But the long story short, uh, the log Brunikovsky inequality is true if both sets are very close to the ball. This is what they derive. Um, any questions? Because of the because of the nodes I can make some sort of question. Because the, because the sphere is very special and um, yeah, we know everything about the brain quality here. Um, uh, now, Kolesnik of the Milman later showed that, in fact, uh, uh, this local version of the log Minkowski inequality not only is true when k is a ball, but when k is a LT ball, VP, and for any p between 2 and infinity. Um, so, even much more is true. And what was really a great news is that it turned out that the local version of the log Minkowski inequality implies the global version of the log Minkowski inequality. It was proved by Cheng Huang Li and Liu, and later it was also proved by Putterman. Uh, Cheng Huang Li and Liu proved it with the equality cases, and they used some deep PD methods, and Putterman found a really beautiful, completely elementary convex geometric proof, although he didn't treat the equality cases. So uh, this was really great news for us, because we, we couldn't actually show it much harder than the situation with the usual uh, Minkowski addition. I mentioned earlier that when Minkowski is equivalent to its local version, it's fairly easy to do. But when we're doing, when we're dealing with this log addition, turns out it's much harder, but still it's true. So it's enough in order to prove the conjecture, it's enough to verify this local version. But uh, one should, of course, remark here that, of course, it's true that the local version implies the global version if we check the local version for all sets and all functions. But we only, if we can only check it for one set, like the deep ball, for example, then uh, it doesn't apply actually any set, right? And in fact, the global log Brunkowski conjecture is not known for any set K for arbitrary L. Such result does not exist. And uh, in view of that, in my opinion, it's interesting to try and check this local version of the log Brunkowski conjecture, uh, not in this sense for a ball or for LP ball for all functions. But conversely, for some very special speed function for all bodies. So something like this I will soon say. In the meantime, let me mention invariances. So Kolesnikov and Milman noticed something we didn't notice, and that is that this local log Minkowski inequality is actually invariant under agent support function. So already invariant, we don't need to strengthen it, which is really nice. Um, in view of that, the following formulation, which was uh, uh, observed by Eli Putterman, uh, is equivalent to log Brunikowski conjecture. And it's this formulation. You can formulate it entirely in convex geometric terms. So the second uh, mixed volume of two bodies K and M is bounded from above by the first mixed volume, plus this additional term, which is the integral on the boundary of the support function of M squared over the support function of K. And uh, uh, of course, another fantastic uh, property is that the local and the global formulation of the log Brunkowski conjecture are invariant on their linear transformation on K. So, anyway, there is a lot of invariances. Uh, in view of this uh, mixed volume formulation, one may observe that when K is the infinity, which is, like I said, classical and Milman proof that the local version is true for K equal to the infinity. Uh, there is actually a very easy way to to note it. So when k is the cube the infinity, then this local version becomes very simple. We have first mixed volume, second mixed volume here, and we in, instead of h m, we just have so the spot function of the cube is always one. So we we are integrating on the boundary, so we just summing up two n quantities. And uh, because of symmetry, instead of summing up two n quantities, we can just sum up n of them. This is very important. Uh, sum up hm of the basic vector squared. And well, it turns out that uh, 
we can find the required estimate in a very simple way. If our body M here is contained in some box associated with it called BM, with appropriate sites, right? We just take our body M, we squeeze it inside the box. Uh, the mixed volumes are monotone. So this term we can estimate by the second mixed volume of the infinity in this box. And this turns out to become a quality. So this is what I'm saying is just one simple example of how this can be checked in one partial case. Now, finally, let me get to at least some results. It's, it's not a very hard result, but uh, well, I guess I will not get to find the result, results. But I will try. Um, here is something we checked by Sasha Kolesnikov recently uh, in the spirit of the question I mentioned earlier. Suppose we fix a very specific speed function, f, which is equal to the absolute value of just the scalar product of the normal with some vector. It corresponds to sort of uh, transforming the convex set with the interval, as you will see. Um, then it turns out that this speed function will always give the right uh, inequality for the local version of the logic when it to index. So for this specific function, it's always true. And moreover, the equality is obtained if and only if k is a cylinder uh, with uh, x is parallel to the vector v. Any questions? So the method of the proof is quite elementary. I recall that the support function of an interval minus vv, if they have an interval in space like this, minus v, v. Uh, its support function is just uh, the, the thin scalar product of u with v, right set value. One can check it easily. Uh, and therefore, our goal, because of all the invariance properties that I mentioned, is just uh, to check that the second mixed volume with an interval is bounded from above by the first mixed volume with an interval plus this term over here, hm this v. Uh, let me recall something that's called Cauchy's projection formula. So Cauchy's projection formula gives an expression of a first mixed volume with an interval simply as a projection of k on the hyperplane orthogonal to the vector. So the way the way to think about it is imagine a convex of k, add an interval to it, and what is the derivative of this transformation? You see, I'm moving my interval parallel to the convex set as written as shown in this picture and seeing how it changes. And it kind of does not de depend on how curved the set is. It just depends on the projection of the set. So I think it, the, the first mixed volume precisely up to correct the scaling equals to the projection of the set. And also it can be written as we kind of seen before already as an inter integral support function of the interval, which is this guy over the boundary. And uh, moreover, this function k plus t interval is linear in t. It's just linear. And therefore, if we take second derivative of a linear function, we get zero. So the second mixed volume with an interval is zero. So basically this part disappears, everything is super easy. Um, so long story short, this is the inequality that we want to prove for any convex, a symmetric convex body K for any uh, vector V, um, this, this holds what's written here. This is my notation for projection. Are there any questions? I just have a quick comment. Uh, so the F, the F that you choose, it, my intuition for it would be like a dilation and a translation. Is that intuition true or? It's a stretching in one direction. It's sort of stretching it in one direction. Okay. Thanks. It's not a translation. It would be a translation if we didn't have absolute value. But we, because we have absolute value, it's extremely different. So. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. It's not, without the absolute value, it's a translation, yes, but it's, it's very much a completely different object. I see, I see. Also, I think value. I forgot to mention time limits. I think there's about five minutes left. Sorry, I forgot to mention that before. I know, I know, and I, I, okay, I plan, I'm make planning it actually, let me just finish with the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna mention any more serious theorems. 
Oh no, I just I just because I, I forgot to say it. So my bad. I do I do have more serious theorems, but I'll do something simple instead. Okay. Um, right. So uh, yeah, this is our goal. How do we prove it? Well, I I find that kind of interesting. It's very simple, but it's um, somehow the right thing to do. That happens here that we relate rejections to sections. Uh, by Fubini's theorem, we can write the volume of a convex set in terms of an integral of its section, as, as drawn here. And the sec central section is always biggest one, by, actually by Blumenkowski inequality again, but I don't have time for this. And because of that, we can always estimate one of the support function from above by the central section over the volume times two. It's just a simple estimate coming from Fubini's theorem. And therefore, if this is the guy that we want to estimate, right? We can estimate it from above as written here. And now the cool thing is that the n minus one dimensional area of a section times the scalar product is actually nothing but projection of a section of k. And it's smaller than the projection of k itself because the projection of a subset is smaller than the projection of a set. And so therefore, they just point why that applies this inequality inside here. And, uh, and we conclude exactly what we wanted to prove again in view of the Cauchy's projection formula. Um, let me just finish with the cure. So this is the end of the proof. There are some other things you can get with this, by the way, but um, the question is, so what is, what if M is a two-dimensional square? Turns out that if instead of M being an integral, we take M being two-dimensional square in the formulation in this, in this statement. Then we get something involving a projection on uh, hyperplane spanning, we're talking about so the span of the two vectors and this we don't know how to prove, and it doesn't follow, unfortunately, from the previous result. It, one cannot hope to obtain it from, from the previous statement, point-wise. But if this inequality was checked to be true, then actually we would know quite a lot already. We would know the local versions and one of the sets is a zone it. I do believe that it could even imply the whole conjecture with some work, but we don't know how to prove such a simple, completely elementary thing. And um, I guess I will just stop. I will. Thank you. There is many more things I uh, tried to study in this regard. But yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. So I'll do my little clap thing. So thanks <laughs> very much. <Whoa. laughs> and uh, yeah, are there any questions? Yeah.